Good morning to everyone. I'd like to thank CIDS President uh, Aniceto Orbeta, Ateneo School of Government Dean Randy Tuanyo, ID Insight Southeast Asia Regional Director Ron Mendoza for inviting me today to share um, the work that I've been engaged in for the last three decades, uh, the community-based monitoring system. I would like to um, talk about three um, aspects of CBMS, um, how CBMS came to be, um, use of CBMS for decision making and policy making at the local level, and institu institutionalization of CBMS. First, let me talk about how CBMS uh, came to be, and I'll provide a brief background. Um, in the in 1991, um, the PIDS embarked on a project called Micro-Impacts of Macroeconomic and Adjustment Policies, or MIMA project, which was supported by IDRC. And the aim of the project was really to be able to track uh, the impacts of all of this uh, macro and adjustment policies, like stabilization policies, liberalization policies, and the like, on vulnerable sectors of the um, population. Um, but what came out of the initial um, assessment was that there was lack of data to monitor impacts of macro policies at the local level. Um, so this was one of the major findings at the early stages of MIMAP. Um, also at around that time, RA 7160 or the local government code was passed in 1991, devolving many functions to the local governments. This increased the demand for more disaggregated data to support local level planning and budgeting. So we came up with um, the CBMS um, design. Um, earlier um, assessment by MIMAP showed that uh, there's really a lack of data and so so we came up with a design um, that would lodge a local monitoring system at the LGU with the participation of the community. Um, we pilot tested this in Pandi Bulacan in 1995. Um, there was first uh, uh, province-wide implementation in Palawan in 2000. And by 2019, uh, we had 111 cities, 1,091 municipalities, and over 30,000 barangays in 78 provinces in the country implementing CBMS. This was also implemented in the lo in local context and selected sites in 29 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So why is CBMS important? Actually, um, as in the case with many other countries, there's very little information at the local levels. So data coming from National Statistics offices are um, provide data at the national, um, at best at the provincial level, um, but very little information at the municipal and barangay um, levels. So um, what CBMS um, aims to do is to fill in the gap by providing more information at the local level. So CBMS um, actually tries to provide, uh, to respond to the following concerns, the lack of necessary disaggregated data for diagnosing the extent of poverty at the local level, for determining the causes of poverty, for formulating appropriate policies and programs, for identifying eligible beneficiaries, so targeting was already a concern even at that time, and assessing impact of policies and programs. Moreover, there was a need for support mechanisms for the implementation of the decentralization policy. So what are the key features of CBMS? One is that it involves a census of all households in the community. Uh, some might say, why not just uh, you know, sample a few households in the community? CBMS was designed uh, to be a census so that this could be easily implemented by local government units. So might not be familiar with um, you know, um, sampling techniques and um, 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 all the statistical capacities that you need to be able to do um, sample surveys. Um, another key feature is that uh, it's local government unit based while promoting community participation. This is very important because we've assessed many local monitoring systems, mainly done by NGOs, and we noted that 
um, this was actually the monitoring systems that they've implemented are coterminous with the projects. Um, and so the issue of sustainability um, is, is critical. Um, nevertheless, we also in, um, uh, recognize that having the communities participate in the monitoring system is actually very, is very important. Um, it taps existing LGU personnel and community members as monitors. This is a strategy to keep the cost of the monitoring system um, low. Um, it also generates a core set of indicators that are being measured to determine the welfare status of the population. These indicators capture the multidimensional aspects of poverty. So even at that time, um, we recognize that income is not adequate to be able to um, assess the poverty status of the um, um, population. Um, moreover, it uses freeware customized for CBMS data collection, processing, and poverty mapping. Um, we realize that um, for the system to be appealing to local government units, um, one, there should be customized uh, system. And uh, more importantly, they should be free because not all of the local government units can afford uh, commercial softwares. Um, another key feature is that it establishes database at each geopolitical level. The aim really is for the data to be used even at the barangay level. So it's not um, data being collected at the local level to be aggregated and used at the national level, but for data to be used at each geopolitical level. Um, what have been the enhancements of the CBMS uh, tools since then? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we started um, implementing, piloting and implementing it um, in 1995. Um, so um, in terms of data collection from paper and pen to the use of tablets and online submission of data, um, in terms of data processing from manual computation to Excel-based processing to a customized processing system that we have developed called uh, StatSim. And then from mapping from barangay spot maps to maps using GPS at the household level. So uh, we've made use of advances in technology um, to be able to enhance the CBMS tool. Um, moreover, the use of CBMS has expanded from local poverty monitoring to monitoring thematic concerns and local governance. So it has been used for disaster preparedness and the monitoring MDGs and SDGs, um, uh, monitoring child labor, uh, gender responsive budgeting, and other concerns. So how is CBMS different from other monitoring systems? I think the main uh, most important difference is that it is LGU based. Um, as I mentioned, that was really designed to ensure sustainability of the system. And also that was at the time that was really uh, there was really a demand from local governments um, for more data to help them uh, come up with informed decisions. Um, there's also a customized processing system that we have developed and um, and this was actually, this became very appealing to local government units, so they don't have to worry about how do you compute, compute um, correctly uh, employment rate, how do you compute school participation rate, and so forth. Um, it was designed for implementation and use at the local level, so it's a census, as I mentioned, because of the difficulty of coming up with a good sampling design, um, taking into account non-response, and so forth. Um, it's relatively, uh, it relatively uses a short questionnaire, um, there's participation of LGU personnel and communities and so forth. Um, also, the indicator system is based on multidimensionality of poverty and it's able to capture simultaneous deprivations. Um, also, um, it, the system um, allows for household and individual level mapping, so we can locate Households don't have access to um, water, um, individuals or children who are not going to school uh, because of the GIS component of the system. So let me turn now to the use of CBMS in decision making at the local level. Um, so why is CBMS important? As I mentioned earlier, it responds to lack of necessary disaggregated data and um, supports um, uh, the implementation of the decentralization policy. 
um, it facilitates greater transparency and accountability in local governance because um, it shows um, you know that if, if certain resources were used to address a particular issue um, the regular conduct of CBMS would show whether in, there's impact in terms of um, um, how resources were used. So you can track over time whether the water supply problem has been addressed, uh, whether um, children, more children are attending school because of um, new um, school facility. Um, and so because of this um, um, availability of, of information, um, it actually facilitates greater transparency and accountability in local governance. So um, CBMS actually generates the necessary local level data and with all the necessary disaggregation for evidence-based decision making. Because it's based on the census of households in the community, you can actually generate household and individual data. And you know it's disaggregated by age, sex, sublocation, income class, and other socioeconomic and demographic characteristics. You can also generate data um, for specific vulnerable groups, such as children, youth, women, elderly, persons with disabilities, and indigenous peoples, among others. And more recently, we've been using CBMS to track SDG at the local level. Um, so you can actually see who are actually being left behind um, with the use of CBMS. So uses of CBMS um, by the local governments, um, they mainly use it for preparation of local development profiles and plans, for the design, targeting, and implementation of programs and interventions, uh, for policy analysis and impact assessment in the context of various thematic concerns. Um, let me provide you a, a few examples. So in the case of Palawan, um, it was the first province to adopt CBMS with the issuance of Provincial Executive Order Number 15 in November 1999, and it produced its first Provincial Human Development Report with the data generated from CBMS. Um, the provincial government has maintained its CBMS database from its conduct of eight rounds of CBMS census since 2000, with last updating done in 2018. So actually, we've attended um, their um, planning um, workshops, and they were able to um, show how uh, to use the information um, to prioritize um, programs being implemented by the province, and um, more importantly, um, to assist municipalities in prioritizing their programs. Um, they were comparing their situation with their neighboring municipalities, and so it was sort of like a, a competition for them um, trying to um, outperform um, the other um, municipalities. In the case of Carmona, um, it implemented CBMS since 2008 and has built its database with at least four rounds of completed CBMS census. Um, and the CBMS enhanced Carmona's ecological profiling and mapping of vulnerable groups and critical facilities. Um, more recently, the LGU CBMS database um, provided basis for distribution of COVID-19 pandemic-related uh, programs. Um, Carmona has also used CBMS extensively in its um, in the delivery of programs for persons with disabilities and um, I think they have um, developed new programs uh, uh, specifically for this particular vulnerable group. Uh, in the case of Tobacco City, um, it has established its CBMS database with six completed CBMS census rounds since 2008, and it actually enabled them to track the impact of safe water projects supported by development partners. They noted in one of their CBMS rounds that um, there was low access to safe water in one of the uh, barangays, and they used the CBMS data to um, submit a proposal to one of the international development partner. And I think the uh, development partner appreciated that they can actually um, locate the households who don't have access to water and um, Tobacco was also able to show what happened after the intervention. Um, I think you can see in the, in the slide there um, that uh, those um, households uh, um, 
that access to safe water because of the, the intervention. Um, so CBMS has improved the LGU's program monitoring and evaluation by providing clear benchmarks and measurable outputs and outcomes. Um, but I think uh, so far I've talked about how um, local government units have used uh, CBMS um, to help them in their um, local planning and, and budgeting and also monitoring the impacts of their interventions. But I think uh, more importantly, CBMS has also empowered communities to demand for the services that they need. Um, so when given the information, um, they realize that there are some services that they need that were not being provided um, and some services that were be being given that were not their top priority. So um, in that sense, CBMS um, empowered the community to demand for the services that they need the most. So let me turn now to the institutionalization of CBMS. Um, so uh, as I've mentioned earlier, um, we, the CBMS network, have been engaged in the development of CBMS tools. Um, and what has happened is that after the pilot testing, it has become um, demand-driven. So LGUs who are interested in implementing CBMS um, would um, approach us and they would they bore me with the, the cost of implementation with um, just technical assistance from um, the CBMS network and also capacity building support from the ILG. Um, there was also regular conduct of training of CBMS trainers from the ILG and, uh, and the academy by um, the CBMS network. Um, there was also um, collaboration with other development partners to scale up implementation of use uh, and use of CBMS. Um, and um, in terms of best practices and strategies in implementation and uses, these were shared and presented in the annual CBMS national conferences by the LGUs themselves. So um, we can see from here that um, it was mainly um, uh, the LGUs um, who um, demanded for um, the system to be established in their own localities and they um, bore the cost of um, uh, the, the, the system, the implementation of the system. And so what we um, re realize is that if LGUs find it useful, they will um, actually invest in the system so that by 2019, as I've mentioned earlier, um, more than half of the, the uh, municipalities and cities have actually implemented um, CBMS. After all of those years, um, uh, there was the uh, bill was uh, introduced during the 17th Congress at the House of Representatives by um, Congressman um, Garcia from Bataan. And um, it was passed into law on April 17, the following year. So they were saying that this is actually um, quite fast. Uh, quite uh, fast. So um, you know, from from the date of filing to um, enactment, um, I think primarily also because um, many of those who were um, in the House of Representatives and also at the Senate were previous uh, local chief executives who were implementing CBMS. So they were quite familiar with. Uh, CBMS and how um, CBMS has actually helped them. Um, and so it, the RA11315 was actually enacted in, in 2019. And some of the major provisions are um, CBMS should be established in every city and municipality for the formulation and implementation of poverty reduction and development, poverty reducing development programs. Um, uh, CBMS data should be used by national government agencies in prioritizing timely, relevant, and much needed social protection programs by government in areas with highest in incidence of poverty. Each city and municipality is the primary data um, um, collecting authority, and um, PSA should be the lead agency in the implementation of CBMS. And um, the aggregated data will be stored by PSA to create a national CBMS data bank. Um, also, fourth and fifth, fourth, fifth, and sixth class municipalities should be given priority financial assistance in the first three years of implementation. And the other cities and municipalities will be assisted thereafter. 
to ensure full implementation of the law. Since enactment, where are we right now in terms of implementation? Uh, the implemented rules and regulation were actually completed um, in 2019. Um, the CBMS Council, led by PSA, DILG, and the ICT, um, has been formed. Um, technical working groups uh, to support the CBMS Council were also created. The data collection instrument has been updated. PSA has provided capacity building, and 638 LGUs have collected data. And um, clean data um, for PSA funded areas, numbering about 323 LGUs, will be available in the third quarter of 2023. So, um, what are the challenges in the institutionalization of CBMS? So, I think um, for me, the, the most important or the primary challenge would be sustaining the interest of LGUs to fund and use CBMS regularly. Um, as I mentioned in the past, the LGUs have been actually funding the conduct of CBMS using their own resources. Um, but with the law, um, there will be some support um, initially for um, uh, the poorer municipalities, but that's still a lot of resources. So I, I really think that the LGU should be encouraged um, to um, fund um, their, their CBMS uh, so they could conduct it regularly. Um, also, there's need for continuing capacity building of LGUs, particularly um, in statistical activities and local planning and budgeting so that they can um, maximize the use of um, uh, CBMS data. And finally, I think keeping the system up to date with emerging concerns. Um, so there's a research component to CBMS. So how do you um, enhance or, or update the, the questionnaire? How do you make sure that um, you're collecting the information that's needed for um, to address emerging concerns. So, but I, I think um, it has been a long journey, but um, I'm very glad that the CBMS has been uh, institutionalized to assist local government units um, for um, local planning and budgeting, and uh, more importantly, has provided um, the tool for the communities to um, also demand um, um, services from um, their um, uh, local governments. Thank you.